much resistance to reopening, given what we're seeing in Europe right now? Well, it's, I think it's stunning because uh, that is what you would do if you follow basic public health uh, uh, practice. So there's sort of a perception that lockdowns and contact tracing is something that the scientific community is behind. And there are some who, who are advocating that. But among, uh, among my colleagues who are infectious disease technologists, most are in favor of a risk-based strategy or an age-based strategy where we protect the elderly and other high-risk groups while the younger will resume lives uh, more or less normally. And that's what Scott Atlas has been advocating and which um, uh, we now put out uh, a declaration, the Great Barrington Declaration, and we put that out this morning and there are already over 500 uh, medical and public health scientists who have co-signed uh, as well as over 500 uh, practicing uh, medical professionals. Wow. So, yes. OK. All right. I, I want yes. people to understand that. I'm sorry to interrupt, Dr. Kolder. I want people to understand this. Now, we're talking to three of the top epidemiologists. I know you guys are modest, but in the world. OK, the three of you. And you're all three saying this approach of locking down, rolling lockdowns does not work. And that is what is happening around the world and what I'm sorry, is being planned if Biden wins uh, the presidency. And he and Dr. Fauci actually spoke tonight on CNN and addressed this natural a national strategy, which should be in place. And I'll let Dr. Gupta and uh, Bhattacharya respond to it. Let's watch. We need to flood the system with testing, the surveillance testing, getting out there, getting into the community and finding out what the level of infection is in the community and doing it on a broad scale. Whether you do it in schools, yes. whether you do it in colleges, whether you do it in factories, that's what we need to do. Uh, Dr. Gupta, I want to go to you on that. So is broad surveillance testing in schools and universities, and I guess everywhere, is that really the way to proceed? I don't think so. I think that's a very inefficient use of um, very limited resources that we have in that regard. And not only when I say limited, I not only do I refer to what we have at our disposal, but also I'm talking about how much we should invest in that process. Because what we really want to do is protect the vulnerable. So. It makes every bit of sense to me that we would take those resources and use them to uh, develop smart strategies to protect the vulnerable. Um, and what's interesting here is by not testing those who are not vulnerable and allowing them to carry on with their lives, which testing frankly impedes, you actually allow that population to build up a level of immunity which in turn protects the vulnerable. So it's a kind of win-win. Don't test them, let them live them, their lives, and let them build up the immunity that will eventually protect the vulnerables. In the meantime, and I stress this is not gonna take forever, it will take three months maybe, um, we've, have, we've been able to observe um, the epidemic unfold in several parts of the world, and I think we can guess safely, whatever that might mean, but the three months is probably maybe six sufficient time for enough immunity to accumulate in those sectors of the population such that the vulnerable could resume normal lives. In the meantime, we try and protect them the best we can and we use our testing capacity to achieve that. Dr. Bhattacharya, today, it was all day long, okay? I heard individual after individual, many of them medical professionals, scoffing at this idea of herd immunity or reaching a level of immunity that, that means generally you can open up everything and go on with uh, life as we had it before, even understanding the danger of the virus. What about that and the Swedish experiment that everyone ridiculed, and even President Trump was kind of poo-pooing Sweden early on. Now, I think uh, denying herd immunity is like denying gravity. Gravity exists and herd immunity exists. 
Uh, many, many, many infections and viruses and pathogens are controlled in the population by herd immunity. Even if you have a vaccine, it's still herd immunity uh, that that protects people against the virus or the or the pathogens. So denying herd immunity is just is it's like denying biology. <clears throat> it's just not right. Uh, the question isn't just her, about herd immunity, really. Its question is how do you safely get there? Uh, the, the the focus lockdown strategy that we're proposing, where you protect the vulnerable and let people live their lives, will get us there more quickly with less loss of life and less damage to to uh, to other aspects of public health that, that, that get ignored, I think, by these doctors that are, are essentially denying, denying uh, you know, basic facts about biology. Um, it, instead, with this focus protection, you, you protect the vulnerable, you quickly build up immunity in the rest of the population, and that will save lives. Uh, just one very important thing here is that the lockdown itself is not costless. Uh, to life, to life, and uh, and and uh, uh, if you think about it, people have delayed cancer treatment. Uh, they've they've delayed going to the doctor because of uh, even with severe heart disease. Uh, parents have not vaccinated their children. Um, there's going to be an increase in breast cancer rates, prostate cancer rates, because of basic screening hasn't been done. Um, I think the lockdown costs will, in the long, in, in, even in the short and intermediate term, have larger and longer health consequences for the population than the focus protection plan, which both will reduce COVID deaths and also redu uh, address many, many, many other public health uh, public health foci that we just ignored. But that's essentially, Dr. Koldorf, what the administration has been doing. I mean, as, as, the, the, focusing on protecting the vulnerable, urging states to open up New York, New Jersey, California, some other states in New England extended their severe COVID restrictions. Some of them are going back into rolling more targeted lockdowns. But to what end? Like, what is New York going to achieve by beginning to close down sectors of the economy again, Dr. Kolder? Yeah, so different states uh, pursue different strategies here. And what, uh, for example, New York has been doing is to uh, protect uh, low-risk college students and uh, low-risk professionals who can work from home while older working class people have to work. So they are building up the, it's the working class who's building up the immunity that eventually will protect everybody. So the working class is having a double whammy, both in terms of COVID-19, which they are taking the burden of, of generating the immunity, there, but also in terms of the uh, other, the consequences of the lockdown on other aspects of, of public health and also the school closings. Uh, rich parents or middle class parents can do tu uh, higher tutorings or pod schools or go put them in private schools. But the working class children, they don't have those options. So they are the ones who are suffering the most from the closure mm. of the public schools. Yeah, the at risk children uh, around the country are suffering the most. But I can tell you, I have three children and two of them are in in person. One is kind of every two weeks on and off. And it, Dr. Gupta, I got to tell you, what's happening to the kids, I think, is one of will go down as one of the most outrageous abuses of supposed science that we've ever seen in recent. I mean, I'd say in the last 50 years, children are being kept from school uh, with a 99.997 survival rate of anyone under the age of 19, it's insanity. I would have to agree. And one, again, particularly thinks of disadvantaged children for whom providing an alternative to what school offers is very, very difficult. So I guess Martin's already said it. I mean, those who have the means can offer some form of alternative, although there is no alternative to the socializing um, and, you know, the learning experience of school. And it, it is, I agree, it's absolutely um, tragic. It, it's, it's unconscionable that we're allowing the young, we're supposed to be, as a society, we're supposed to give everything 
to protect the young. And I know I've had mothers writing into me saying, you know, I would seal myself up for a year happily if my child could go to school, if my um, slightly older child could go to university and have the experience that they deserve. That's If that's not what we're for, then what are we here for? What's the whole point of this? And Dr. Bhattacharya, the uh, president uh, thought it was very important to be uh, on camera tonight after coming home uh, to the White House from Walter Reed, and he recorded this video. Let's watch. And I learned so much about coronavirus. And one thing that's for certain, don't let it dominate you. Don't be afraid of it. You're going to beat it. We have the best medical equipment. We have the best medicines, all developed recently. And you're going to beat it. I w Okay, so the president comes out and speaks, and people went nuts. Like, how dare he? He's a vector of the disease. He's super spreading throughout the White House. He's doing a video. Like, how dare he be optimistic? How did he look? And what about the overall message, Dr. Buttershaw? Can, can I say about the overall message? That's exactly what I learned in, uh, about public health, what you're supposed to do. You're, supposed to, you're not supposed to sow panic. You're supposed to reassure give accurate information about about risks, trust people to make good judgments on their own behalf. Um, the president did that, I think, tonight, don't you think? I mean, I, I think uh, I think uh, I'm obviously like he's <laughs> has a has a real spirit to him, doesn't he? Um, but I think uh, but I think that that message is right. It's act. It is accurate and consistent with the data um, that COVID is not a death sentence. And I think we've created this idea in the public mind that it is something so unique and so deadly that we should utterly end all normal existence as a result of, of, of it. That's not right. We can have a much better way. Protect the vulnerable, shield them for a short period of time until we reach a level where there's there's population immunity. And then for the rest of the rest of the world, uh, let us live our lives. And for folks who, for vulnerable, who you know, if you, if you know, if your life is meaningless yep. without hugging your grand grandchild, children, you know, you have to, you have to balance risks in everything we do in our life. Uh, doctors, all of you, uh, I'm in awe of your expertise and your courage in speaking out and uh, all that you've published over the years. Because I have actually read a lot in the last six months. You're all brilliant, much smarter than most politicians. Thank you so much for joining us.